Um, great. Well, first of all, thanks, uh, thanks a million to OGI and IDEA, colleagues, for inviting me to join the meeting. I'm very sorry about not being able to join by Skype. The connection here is not so good. I'm actually calling in from Bamako and Mali. Um, so hopefully the call won't drop uh, while I'm, while I'm uh, talking. Um, so what can an international actor do, um, and here I mean development actors, what can they do to respond to these challenges? And um, this is what I was asked to talk about. Um, so building on what the three speakers have just discussed and drawing from some of the work that uh, we did for DFID on the impact of organized crime and go on governance in developing countries, I'm going to focus on three interrelated actions that they could do as a starting point. So the first one um, I would suggest is acknowledge reality. So organized crime is a reality in all countries today, whether developed or developing democracies or not, as is the manner in which organized crime and corruption interact. And there are sufficient, sufficient examples, as we know, of how the spoils of organized crime have been and can be and are being used to advance political goals. So ignoring this reality from the outset means that international efforts might only serve to cement relations between political actors and organized crime or potentially legitimize the flow of illicit funds into politics. So experience holds that despite core policy development and core policy documents, including the WZR uh, from 2011 and numerous declarations and statements in the Security Council, that this is not necessarily the case. There are some interesting examples emerging, for example, how the UN has approached, has approached the drug trafficking issue across West Africa, um, and also how OECD DAC, DFID, USAID, and NGIZ, for example, have been investing, investing in preliminary research on these issues. Um, and I think uh, reports like IPI spotting the spoilers handbook is also quite useful. And so the second point I would suggest is that international actors, and here I go back again to donors, is do your analysis, do it regularly and share it. So international actors have become pretty good at developing political economy analysis, typology, and threat analysis tools uh, to inform their programming in different countries. We're all pretty familiar with those tools. And they've not been so effective in applying these tools to these kinds of questions. Efforts are being made, I think, to overcome this gap. Uh, for example, some organizations like uh, NAMD, uh, International IDEA, and who are focused on providing support to political parties have started to use, for example, political economy analysis to determine whether and how to engage with political parties on the question of dirty money in politics. And some donors, as I mentioned, albeit still a, a limited number, are beginning to also use these tools looking specifically at organized crime. So the room for that international actors have to actually maneuver on these issues is often limited. Uh, particularly in traditional development settings where political leverage is limited. And so if a recipient country's core if a recipient country's core interests or the interests of elite groups within that country are threatened by external actors, that country can easily play the sovereignty card or impose a range of obstacles to prevent, for example, donor agencies from overstep overstepping non articulated boundaries. This is all the more complex in, in countries where decision makers might be complicit in different forms of organized criminal activity and using illicit funds for political objectives. So for development actors in particular, knowing when to engage on these issues is, is quite critical, hence the analysis focus. So in this regard, a recent USAID, USAID study on drugs and development that we refer to in, in our DFID study suggests using such tools to determine, for example, the complicity of political actors in criminal activity, so to ensure that tax payers' money will not be wasted if invested in supporting specific institutions or processes, and also using these types of analyses to determine the degree of pushback that international actors might confront, for example, if they start insisting on reforms that will directly impact on the interests of different political or business elites. These, uh, the kinds of analytical tools I mentioned earlier can serve as an important crutch in this regard. And as I mentioned earlier, it's also important to ensure that the findings of these analysis tools are regularly updated. We haven't been so good at that either. And that they're shared with other international actors, including, for example, specialized aid agencies such as DEA or SOCA. These will not necessarily share intelligence information with us, but it's always useful to test our assumptions with some of these people who can yay or nay or whether we're on the right track. Um, and then also sharing some of this information with potential reformers in and outside government. And this is something that we could potentially discuss in more detail later. And the third point I make is um, 
I think it, it's very important to take a preventative rather than a preventive rather than just a reactive approach or blend both in, in different approaches to these issues. So often we only begin reacting to, to situations in which illicit money has entered the political system when violence actually has emerged, even if there have been strong indications that illicit money will have penetrated this, the system. As we note in the DIFFIS study, in situations where organized crime is prevalent, it is the absence of violence that should be of concern, as criminal groups and networks can constitute very real threats to the state, not through open confrontation, but by penetrating state institutions, through bribery and corruption, and subverting or undermining them from within. And the cases uh, of the case of Colombia is a, is, a, is a core one in this regard. Um, when applicable to many countries, and here I quote uh, Peter Gastro from his, his great piece on Kenya called Termites at Work, um, he notes that governments that lack the capacity to counter organized crime run the risk of becoming criminalized or to capture states over time. So, but despite this reality, many development and security actors continue to assess organized crime and the penetration of politics uh, by illicit money in relation to the scale of violence it produces. And I think the current situation here in Mali, where I am, is, is an, an important example. Despite broad knowledge of links between high-level officials in Balago and criminal groups operating in the north, the country was largely portrayed as a development success before, before the crisis. It was only when the situation turned violent did attention turn to some of the more structural issues underpinning these relations. But, but six months on, it's not exactly clear whether international actors have learned from experience or whether we're facing another case of a piece of change. Um, it doesn't necessarily look good on the ground. Um, and finally, in the different report, we also outlined a lengthy series of actions that development actors in particular could invest in when, once they've done their analysis to buffer the political system protected from organized crime and the infiltration of illicit money. For example, we outlined a series of activities that could help safeguard the legitimacy and integrity of the political and legislative processes and political contestation. And we also include a long, a long range of activities involving civil society, as well as regional uh, or national think tanks. The role of the latter, especially the think tanks um, uh, in particular, has been uh, ignored largely by international actors in some regions, especially here in West Africa, which in turn, uh, we argue, poses serious problems regarding the internalization and ownership of responses to the issue of, of illicit money in politics. Um, and then to, uh, just finally, many of these actions aren't necessarily new, the actions that we suggest in the report, um, but considering them from the lens of organized crime um, and corruption or a blend of both can help in terms of doing less harm and becoming a lot more effective in protecting the system. So I'm going to stop there because I'm not too sure if I'm still online. Uh, <laughs> you, you are indeed, Camino, and uh, uh, the good news is that the telephone line held. Thank you so much for your, your perspective on how the development community and development actors can, uh, can address some of these issues. Now, before we head into the discussion, and uh, last but not least, we are going to turn to Francesca Recanatini um, from the World Bank. Francesca, are you there? Yes, 